How are you? Yes, Helen, it's time. Good to see everyone. I don't want to jinx it, but they're actually calling for rain today, time, so whatever it takes. <laughs> good to good to have answered prayers. Good to have the avenue of prayer, and good to have answered prayers, uh, especially on Miss Judy. Um, so thankful that she's doing better, and this to lend a little bit, and Bill's still doing a little bit better, and and I know there's people I'm probably forgetting, but those that's that's doing good, we're thankful for, and those that still need God's healing hands, we're continue to pray for those. Anybody got, I'll, I'll not do any announcements, but has anybody got anything that they'd like to have added to the prayer this morning before we start? Let's go to God in prayer. Holy Lord God Almighty, Father, we're so very thankful and grateful, dear Lord, that you've blessed us at the start of another day on this earth, Father, that you have sent your precious only begotten Son to this earth, and he had lived a life that would bring you honor and glory, Father, that he would teach and preach and heal spiritually as well as the physically sick, that he would suffer the trials, temptations, and tribulations that we suffer, and yet he did it sinless and perfect and blameless. Father, that he was obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, Father, that we might have that hope of life eternal with you someday. Father, help us never take that for granted. Help us always strive to honor you and serve you and be thankful for his sacrifice. Father, as we open up your word, Father, that we might glean from it those things that you would have us to apply to our lives and share it with others to the best of our ability. Father, give us that burning desire to strive to imitate your son. Forgive us when we sin and fail you, Father. We're thankful for Judy and Bill and those others whose prayers have been answered. We continue to ask you to be with them. We ask you to continue to be with Terry Blankenship and those others that's on our prayer list. Father, especially those who might be spiritually lost. We ask you all in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, <clears throat> the last two weeks we've opened up this book from Larry, <coughs> Leroy Brownlow and, and uh, why am I a member of the Church of Christ? And, uh, you know, I've said this before, you know, it's, 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 it's It's better for whoever's teaching the class. You know, I, I know Dan and Clayton have finished this class, you know, uh, last few months, and di or, you know, different subject, obviously, but, you know, they, they would have had to done a lot of studying and reading and trying to, trying to get a handle on everything so that they'd, you know, be able to try to, you know, share that. And I know Roy, I've talked to him many times, and, and the number of hours he spends, uh, you know, just preparing, it's just, it's unreal. So we get more out of it, I'm sure, than most people. But by the same token, if, if we're to be effective, if we're to, if we're to uh, be a benefit, then we need to know... Um, If we're hitting the mark, if you will, if we're if we're 
been beneficial to you. So with that in mind, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, I'm going to ask you, you know, what we've done previously. It's kind of like, you know, I, most people don't. Some people probably strive on it, but I don't. It's kind of like getting tested in school. You don't know if you're learning anything until you, in some, until you get tested. Well, we're going to get tested one of these days, whether we like it or not. We're going to come, we're all going to come before that judgment seat, and we're all going to have to answer for our lives. Uh, you know, Second Corinthians 5.10 for we must all appear before the judgment seat, but each one may receive the things done in his body, whether good or evil. And so we're going to have to answer. And part of, the, part of that answer is not, and unfortunately, it's the answer, well, I didn't know, is probably not going to cut much once we get there. So I say all that hopefully to be encouraging, not discouraging, encouraging us to... You know, if you need to highlight your Bible, if you need to draw a red line under passages, you know, whatever you need to do, uh, if you need to do uh, like the Brians and Acts 17, 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things are so. So whether it's, me or somebody else in one of these classes that's teaching, um, we're trying to do what our elders has uh, asked us to do. More importantly, what God's commanded us to do is to try to, you know, commit these things to faithful men and, and women so that they may be able to teach others also. And so uh, with that said, somebody tell me, based on what we studied the last two weeks. What, we've had two lessons, so this is not like you have to go back a lot. We've had two lessons. Uh, answer, answer it in your mind, whether somebody else speaks up or not, answer it in your mind. If I was asked today why I'm a member of the Church of Christ, based on the last two weeks uh, study, can, can you, can you in, in your mind, can you remember what them two reasons is? Why am I a member of the Church of Christ? Anyone? Okay. Yeah, thank you, Luther. I appreciate that. Um, Luther's going to mic for me. I appreciate it so much that he took that initiative without being asked. So, as Clayton said, reason number one is because we're a member of this church because this church is built on a scriptural builder. Matthew, wh where do we find that? Somebody else. Where do we find that? There you go. Matthew 16, 18. You know, we need to know some of these basics. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is... The adult should be more mature class. We need to know some of these basics. Sometimes it will surprise you if you're in some of these other uh, classes, uh, Easton and uh, Lila and, and, and Miley and some of those. Sometimes you get some of them classes and they put us to shame, and that shouldn't be. So we need to, we need to know some of these basics. All right. So that was week one. And there's a, lot, there's a lot more to it. But that, you know, if you can remember one, you, again, you don't have to remember everything, but you need to have a, a basis. And so one reason, somebody asked you, one reason, Christ built it. He, you know, it's a scriptural builder, and you go to the God's Word, and, and you, find, you find that. So what was the uh, week two? What was the scriptural reason why I'm a member of the Church of Christ. Anybody remember? Yeah, the Godly Foundation. And so, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of verses that uh, went along with that. And 
and and I, and, I, and again, I don't think that I don't think that we need necessarily need to remember that we've got the, we've got the word we can hunt, we can search it and stuff. But again, you know, in Acts four, verse eleven, this is the stone which you builders rejected, which has become the chief cornerstone. Okay, so again, it's it, it if we can. We don't need to remember. I mean, there was like uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 3.11, Ephesians uh, 2.20, and, and several others. It'd be nice to, you know, as, as we study that. But, you know, the, the good thing about these smartphones, and it's good and it's bad, the good thing about these smartphones, you know, you, you can just ask the smartphone and say, you know, uh, you know, where's the... Where's the chief cornerstone? And they'll pull up umpteen verses. So you've got that ability, but you need to know, you need to know that there is a chief cornerstone. So if you can remember, uh, like I said, uh, Acts 4.11, this is a stone which you builders rejected, which has become the chief cornerstone. If you can remember one verse, then you, then you have got something that you can share with friends, families, or whoever. So that's two scriptural reasons. Okay, uh, and why is why is scripture why is scripture so important? This is not a trick question. Now, it's the word of God, it, the word of God and what and what uh, what's that going Becky? What's that what's that going to help us in the long run? Because that's the word of God. What's that going to do for us? It teaches us that the word of God is true, and if we follow it, then we're following by his example, correct? Okay, and, and what, when we talked about truth, we talked about truth uh, previously, and we, and, and we look and we think about this in John 4, 23, it says, but now the day is coming, and now is when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. We also went to John 8, 31. Then those Jews who believed Jesus, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, then you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So if to abide in his word, okay, to abide in the scripture, then it's going to make us free, and it's going to make us free from what? Sin. They're going to make us free from sin if we obey the gospel, correct? So that would be one, that would be one thing. The other thing I think about <clears throat> is uh, James <clears throat> one twenty one. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. Or I think the King James says the engrafted word. So, because of the scripture, then because of that scripture, it's able to save our souls if we do what with it? We, yeah, we, we, we got to make it part of our lives. We got to, we got to obey it, correct? Um, you know, we go to 2 Timothy 2, 16 and 17. We go there a lot and... Uh, you know, it's all Scripture is given for inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. But sometimes we skip over, and, and it's, we talked about this a lot. You got to take, make sure we're taking our uh, Scripture in in full context. But in verse 15. Uh, if you think about it, of Second Timothy, Paul's writing to who? Timothy. Yeah, writing to Timothy. But right, right before uh, chapter three, verse fifteen, uh, earlier in the chapter three, 
He's, he's writing to the elders. He's writing to the deacons. And he's, you know, setting, setting up basically what we have today as guidelines to appoint elders and deacons. And then he c continues there oh, later on, and he says, you know, Timothy, I'm coming to you. But then he says here in verse 15, he says, but if I'm delayed, but if I'm delayed, I write to you so that you may know, <clears throat> I write to you so that you may, I'm sorry, Bob. Yeah, I write to you that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, the church of the living God, who is the pillar and ground of the truth. Now that's first, I, I, I've got that backwards, that's first Timothy 3, that's first Timothy 3, 15. But while we're there, back, back to what Becky said about the truth, why is it important for us to be a member of the correct church? Right there in, in, in 1 Timothy 3.15 tells us, because the church is the church of the living God and it's the pillar and ground of the truth. And you know, we talk about uh, the truth, you know, uh, again, John 14.6, Jesus talking to uh, Thomas says, I am the way, the truth, and life. So the pillar and the ground of the truth is both based on the cornerstone, it's Jesus. And so the church, Jesus being the head, Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. So Christ being the head of the body. All right. Who's the body? The church. But is the church this building? The church is the body of believers, correct? And so... Make sure we understand that. So for us to be, and we call it the church, and it's, it's a little bit, we know it, but sometimes we don't. I, I, sometimes I think it's hard for us to separate this physical building with the body of Christ. We, not this building, we collectively and individually should be that pillar and ground, pillar and ground of truth. And again, if we're going to be pleasing to the Lord, then we need to uh, again share this scripture. The other uh, scripture that I was thinking of again was Second Timothy uh, three fifteen instead of First Timothy three fifteen. That from childhood you have known the holy scriptures. Which, able, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So that would be your other, that'd be another scripture to go to. Some people say, well, you know, why is scripture important? Well, James 1, 21 says it's able to save our soul. It takes that and grafted word in. 2 Timothy 3, 15 says, make us wise for salvation. So, but in, in catch that, when Paul's writing to Timothy, he says, he says that you've known from childhood the holy scriptures. And that means a lot. When you, when you think about the holy scriptures, this is God inspired. So, any thoughts or comments or questions before we go on? Quiet bunch today. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there you go. Right time, right place, right name. Okay, so the third reason, the third reason that we're a member, or I'm a member of the Church of Christ, a church not founded at the scriptural place is not the scriptural church. Okay? Now, this back to what I said. Don't get tied up on a physical building here. Now, the author here says if a church was, it was, was started in London or New York or someplace like that, it's not the scriptural church, okay? So, but he's talking, my opinion, he's talking about a building now. 
I'm, I'm talking about the church that Jesus built in Matthew 16, 18 that started and started when? When did it start? Pardon? Day of Pentecost, right? And we'll get into that later. But, but you, can't, you can't hardly, uh, chapter 3 and 4 kind of run together here, but you can't hardly discuss a scriptural place. And the scriptural place was where again? Jerusalem, right? So you can't hardly discuss the scriptural place without discussing the scriptural time, if you will. And, uh, and so we'll, we'll get into that. But if you have your Bibles... If you would, please turn to uh, Isaiah 2. And uh, <clears throat> let's start reading here. I'm going to read just verses 2 and 3, but I want you to kind of read with me because it's sometimes it, uh, you retain more reading it still here, if that makes sense. Now it shall come to pass. I'm reading from the New King James. This is tough on me. The, the book here is all the references is in American Standard, and I've done all my memory verses in New King James, so it's, I have trouble. I have trouble with one, let alone trying to go back and forth, but now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Verse 3, many people shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Uh, Bob, you're there close. Uh, pull up uh, Micah. I think it's chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. And Luther, when you get that, uh, I want you to read that. Haley, if you don't mind, pull up uh, Micah 116. When you get it, Bob. Now it shall come to pass in the last days the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Okay. I don't know if you caught that, because, I mean, if you, read, if you read the first one, Micah's almost tit for tat. It, 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 it pretty well says uh, pretty well the same thing. And I kind of, I, I, I thought about that when I was reading and kind of thinking about this, and I Google searched it just to see, and I was trying to figure out, well, did Michael, was, was he quoting Isaiah or vice versa? And really it was, a, the, what I got out of it was, wasn't clear. It, it, they were both contemporaries. In other words, they both lived about the same time period. It, this would have been, this prophecy, again, would have been, you know, some 700 years prior to Christ coming. So the, the main thing I think we need to get out of it's not, it's irrelevant uh, on, on uh, if one got it from the other, if they both got it directly from God. The point is, uh, God seemed fit to put it in his word, and, it's, and I got to think about this, kind of like maybe, you know, uh, if you're if you're trying to prove something, you need what? Yeah, two or three witnesses, right? And I got to thinking about that. Well, I don't know. I don't know what. I, I don't know the mind of God. Okay, but I got to, I got to thinking. You know, 
he, he repeated almost verbatim uh, the, both passages and, and uh, the, the Google search that I checked said it's kind of like the book of Hebrews. We really don't know the author of Hebrews. Well, we really don't know who authored this or if God was directly. But the point is, he prophesied the church. He not only prophesied the church, but there's about three things that we can get to that. One was, again, that the church would be established, and it would be established, as we've already said, it'd be established at Jerusalem, and that all peoples would flow to it, and it would go forth from Jerusalem, right? Um, I'm thinking of... Uh, I think. Okay. Acts, Acts 1 8 says, uh, but when something, but you shall receive power, let me think, I'm drawing a blank, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you shall be witnesses to me in all of Jerusalem, in all of Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So we know, we know that it was, it was predicted and prophesied. Uh, you know, 700 and some years ago by those two, two gentlemen. Haley, if you would go ahead and read uh, Zechariah 1, 16. Zechariah writes, Therefore thus saith the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts. And the surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Thank you. Okay. And the, hopefully you caught that. What do you say? I'll build my house, right? And what did we just read in Second Timothy 3.16? He built his house. Built my house, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So, so he's, done everything he's, he's done everything that he said he would do. And uh, so, okay. All right, and back to what we talked about a time frame. When did this happen? How did, how does the scriptures, how did the scriptures uh, say this happened or prophesied? It's going to happen in what days? Latter days, right? And so it did. And, you know, so everything that uh, Micah four one and two and Isaiah two two and three and Zechariah one sixteen, they all three, basically, you know again prophesies the same thing and, and it, everything everything's come true. Any thoughts, comments, or questions? You talked about the latter days and we didn't understand that the Christian age and that's not an age where Jesus is going to come back and set up an earthly kingdom. Very good. Uh, hope you, everybody heard that. You know, we, we talk about the patriarchal age, you know, Abraham and, and, and Isaac and Jacob and those. We, we talk about the Mosaic age. And, and, and everything, everything leads to the day. We are in the latter day. As Bob just pointed out, when this is done, uh, second, uh, first, first Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, when this is done, Jesus is going to come back. He's not, he's, he's not, it does not say there. He's going to meet us in the air. It doesn't say he's ever going to put his foot back on this earth. Haley? Yeah, uh, I think Bob brought out a good point, but for us to really understand their mindset versus our mindset is that we have the New Testament. We fully understand how uh, these scriptures apply to Christ and how they are uh, how, how they were fulfilled in Christ. At their point of view is at the writing looking forward they don't fully understand where this is coming from and so a lot of the brethren even even Peter and the apostles still thought that it was going to be an earthly kingdom built on uh, Jerusalem built in Jerusalem so uh, I think it's something that we need to think about just a little bit when we look back at our 
at, at our history, but at our prior brothers and sisters, you know. When you're saying prior brothers and sisters, and Haley, are you talking what time period are you speaking? I'm I'm talking back back all the way to Genesis, but okay. Okay. I'm I'm talking about our history, uh, where we came from, the foundation that we're built on. You know, uh, okay. they they were they were being taught as we were, as we are now. They were being taught as as a new. I, I look at it as a, as a new babe in Christ coming in. They didn't understand. They don't understand. Uh, the history and how it applied. Uh, they could read this in Zechariah, they could read this and not fully understand that until they've been taught enough. And, and therefore, uh, you, you get Peter and you get Paul, and you know, all the apostles, you get, you get all those until they've been taught through Christ, through the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, we have a clear vision uh, if we spend time in the Word. Yeah, and you, you know, Haley, you make a good point. We have a clear vision, or should have a clear vision, if we spend time. You know, 2 Timothy 2.15, 2, be diligent, present yourself, prove to God a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. So if we spend time, and I mentioned Acts 17.11 earlier about the Brians, if we do what, if we do what they do, we've got what they didn't have, and that's what, that's your point. So, as we talked in Acts 1 8, the Holy Spirit come upon the apostles. From that point on, um, I, you know, I'll go out on a limb, but from that point on, we don't have the same excuse as those prior to that point. I'll put it that way. Uh, we have got the complete uh, the written word, and uh, I think it's James 1. 25, maybe somebody had to check me. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in, in it is, is not a forgetful doer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. If we do that, then we're going to get we're going to get the reward. If we don't do it, then I, I'm glad I'm not the judge. Anything else? Okay. Uh, Zion and Jerusalem, yeah, is pretty synonymous. The, the first one, the first uh, temple was built was on Mount Zion. Okay. Uh, just, you know, it, it's interesting to me, and, and again, it talks about mountains, and, and, and I've done a, for Happy Hall, I've, I've done a, uh, a presentation up there for uh, one of the sessions, and, uh, and, it's, and it's basically, talking about climbing the mountain. Well, you know, when you think about, you know, when you think about climbing the mountain, you know, one of the first things pops in your mind be something like Mount Everest. And I'm not going to, don't, don't hold me to this exact number, but, you know, somewhere around 29,000 uh, feet elevation above, you know, sea level. Well, then, <laughs> when, I th when I was thinking about this and studying this and stuff, I thought to myself, it's, you know, it talks about going up on, going up on the mountain and and uh, Jerusalem itself is like just a sh shade less than 2500 so but it still says going up on the mountain and and I and I again I'm a simple person so I've got to try to understand this well I think it's Jericho but again I wouldn't uh, uh, somebody have check number but I think Jericho's like X amount of feet under sea level, so the elevation's crazy low. Well, if you're down, if you're starting down there, you're going up on a 2,500 mountain. You're, you know, you're going quite a bit. But the, the main thing is, listen to what the scripture says. Uh, I think it's Matthew 28:16. This is this is right. Uh, this is right uh, before. The soldiers had been bribed, and the Great Commission was getting ready to happen. And, and if you can catch this, because I don't know how I caught this, but 
It says, then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee. And catch this. They went away into Galilee to the mountain, which Jesus had appointed for them. Where did Jesus send them to wait for the Holy Spirit? Jerusalem, right? To the mountain. So they went, they went up to the mountain. I don't know if that helps you, but it helped me. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Uh, yes? Is there the, uh, the mountain that's spoken of might be uh, Gagatha? I, I just was curious about that. Well, in, uh, in reference to what, in to, reference to, to what? To the, to the uh, mountain that uh, the, the that, the church, one? that the church was built on or started on. No. No, okay. I mean, well, since I say no, Haley, simply if you go back and reread Isaiah 2, 2, and 3, if you go back and read Micah 4, 1, and 2, uh, if you go back to those verses, they, they specifically mention Jerusalem is what's prophesied. Yeah. And I, I see no prophecy of Golgotha. Okay. Yeah. And, and so, and I don't see nothing in the Bible that, that says it, right? And we, go, we, do book, we do book, chapter, and verse, so, I mean, that would be, you know, I, I guess what I'm saying is if it's not supported in the Scripture, I, I say no. Anybody else? Dan? 28 through 32. I don't want to get ahead of you. No, but that's fine. Go ahead. If you got it there, if you would, just read it, because we, you know, we're going to run out of time, so I never get through everything. So in verse 28, it says, and, out, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men and your dreams of dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days I will pour out my spirit and I will show wonders in heavens and in the earth and blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon shall into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord shall come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord it shall be delivered for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said and the remnant of the Lord sh uh, whom the Lord shall call. Okay, so, and, yeah, so again, Zion, uh, Jerusalem, they're, they're good. Anybody else? Yeah, Haley. Well, uh, part, of the, part of the reason I was asking that was because, um, of course, Christ was crucified on, on, on the cross at Golgotha, which was actually part of that mountain system right there at Jerusalem. Uh, so uh, was the church started I don't, I don't I'm not exactly sure where Peter uh, sp spoke to the to the crowd uh, on on Pentecost uh, wherever it was with water but I'm just saying I don't I'm not exactly sure but uh, that with the sacrifice of Christ uh, it's where the blood was shed and so I kind of wondered if uh, the exact time of the church okay and so was it was it uh, at the shedding of the blood was it beginning there or was it uh, built, or was it added to uh, at Pentecost? So that's, that's okay. a question I have. And and, okay. and, and we're going to run out. We're going to run out of time. But but uh, for you individually, and anybody else has kind of got that question, just reread Acts one and two uh, because you're going to. Well, for example. Uh, Acts 2 and verse 5 says, and there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews. Okay? And, and, and you just, if you read that whole deal, that's where they were. And when you go to verse 41 of Acts 2, they added 3,000. And then pre and then verse 47 says, praising God, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who've been saved. And like I said, this will be part of that study before we, so we'll cover it in more detail. 
but we'll run out of time today. But if you read, if you read that, uh, and like I said, in Acts 1 8, when the Holy Spirit came on the apostles, and well, it goes on a little farther than that, but, uh, but that's when it's prophesied. And then you get into Acts 2 when they actually received the Holy Spirit. But th that all happened at Jerusalem. And, and, if you, and again, we'll get into this in this study before we get done. But before, before Pentecost, the church was just talked about it. We'll build. Come in future. Uh, but then whenever you get, uh, when you get to right after uh, Peter preached in Acts 2.38, when you get from there on, then it, they're added to the church. And it mentions the church. So in, at least in my studies, um, anybody else got a thought? But like I said, Rick, I'm sorry. Through the work of Jesus was one aspect. The other point was is when the, the, the word church refers to a called out body assembly designed for a specific purpose that is formed by the, by the one that has the right to call the assembly. And so that assembly is the secret there to me is in verse 3 in Isaiah when he says, For out of Zion, which is referring to a specific place, shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That was necessary in order for the call to go out. You know, yes, Jesus' work was done on the cross. We have questions about the position of the apostles at that point. But it was this prophecy that would be the doorway that would establish the called out assembly that was from the world. And may have, you know, we can say, well, it may have started with apostles, but the prophecy is in reference to what would take place there in Jerusalem, as Dan pointed out, it's clear from Joel 2. Yeah, and, and, and real quick to echo what Rick said, when you think about this, when the apostles uh, received that Holy Spirit and and, and and then I, I think about this. Then in Cornelius, what happened? They, they same thing said, we was done the same as they was. So my point, my thought was again echoing what Rick said. My thought was not only the prophecy in Joel two twenty eight through thirty two, but if you reread, if you reread what we said, Isaiah two two three. If you reread that, Micah one uh, uh, four one and two, and Zechariah one six. If you put all that together. There's, there's, I don't see how any way you can come up with uh, the church not being prophesied to come into, in Jerusalem and at the day of Pentecost. Bob? Well, the scripture several places. I think back to the 20th, that's verse 28, where it talks about the church was purchased with the blood of Christ. So until the blood was shed, there was no church. Right. And I think that's why we see when Jesus talks about the fact that the kingdom is at hand, and John talked about the kingdom is at hand, and then, as you already mentioned, then comes the crucifixion, and from that point on, then, it's not spoken of in the future. It's spoken of being in existence or today uh, in the past. Yeah. You know, Bob, Bob referenced in uh, um, Acts 20, 28, therefore take heed to yourself and to all the churches which he purchased his own blood. So that's what he's referencing to you know, like, like I said, we'll get into this. Uh, I think Clayton had something, and maybe Larry. Oh. In Mark 9, 1, Jesus made a very important statement. Good point. He said, there are some of you that are living right now that will not die until the kingdom comes with, with power. power. That power came in Acts chapter 1. The church was established. The kingdom was established in Acts chapter 2. It's very clear when you look at Acts they chapter 1. Yep. Larry, did you have something? Uh, re I, I just reiterating and just rolling over in my mind that you know you look at these things a thousand times and and uh, and they're all new every time you look. But in Jesus' statement to Peter, he said, "Who do I, who do men say that I am?" And then he answered the question, and then he made the comment, "Thou art Christ, Son of the Living God." And he said, "Upon this confession, I'm going to build my church." So it's somewhere in the future now. 
on the day of Pentecost, Jesus also gave him, he said, and I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. Okay, well, a key is going to open something. It's a door. And when Peter opened that door for the first time on the day of Pentecost, probably standing on the, on the steps of the temple in Jerusalem, and men and brethren, what shall we do? And he told them what to do. He said, you rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, and you shall be added. So that's where we find the door open for the first time, and it's still open, and we're still calling men to that door. Okay. Thank you all. I've got one thing to say before we disperse. Kathy Bright is a wonderful, wonderful person, and I don't need to tell anybody that, but I, I think about that, and, and, and she's, not, she's not Rick's faithful servant. She's God's servant. And she, she, she goes, Gina, Beck, Terry, she goes and picks you guys up, takes you wherever, every little function there is, music, whatever. I can, we all should in, imitate, and, and hopefully a lot of you do, but I, I just seen her out there today, and I just, I just felt, let me just say something. Thank you all.